it is round two of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. It's cold, it's damp, the rain is coming, the rain is going, the rain is coming back. Nobody knows what to do for tyres, nobody can guarantee what the weather will be like for the next hour and a bit. Welcome back to Alton Park, another great race in prospect. Very dark clouds looming over the Cheshire countryside, but we have a 35 strong grid. One GT for McLaren absent after engine dramas from race one. But the pointy end of the grid is going to be ultra competitive once again. Joe Osborne and David Addison track side bring Lucas down in the pits. And this our second race of the day, second round of the championship. These two one hour races with the mandatory pit stops. And we had a great first race, helped in part by variable weather conditions, uh, but also helped by the fact that it is a stellar entry this year for the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. Let's quickly take a look back at race one. It began with James Cottingham's yellow Mercedes on pole position. Kevin Say, the Macanese driver, lining up alongside. The road was damp but drying, and James Cottingham it was who assumed the race lead, chased by reigning champion Ian Loggy and then Richard Neary as they dived down towards Old Hall Corner for the first time. Andrew Howard was making progress in his Aston Martin, and he would be one of the stars early on as off the road went Morgan Tilbrook. That McLaren would feature right at the very end of the race battle between Richard Neary and Kevin Say took out attention. Kevin Say getting more confident as the road dried out and making his move. But this was the move of the race, really, from Andrew Howard. Not one, but two places gained, diving down towards Old Hall Corner. And then as the pit window opened, it was time for the Ams to pit early and put in the pro drivers to give them as much track time as possible. Sam Neary was edged out onto the grass and he had this huge moment. Thankfully, he didn't take anybody with him, but the car was beached in the gravel and that brought out the safety car. On the restart, Jules Grunon was passed just before the timing line by Dan Harper's charging BMW. That resulted in a drive-through for the Northern Irish driver. As up front, it was Johnny Adam leading the way from Marcus Clutton and then Ross Gunn in the Aston. And as they squabble for second place, Adam pulled away and the rain fell late race even more heavily. Ross Gunn went back into second and then at the last corner, Gunn chanced his arm for the race lead. Couldn't do it. He and Adam oh so nearly slithering off the road, but it was the Mercedes win. Johnny Adam victorious, James Cottingham, his co-driver, taking his first British GT victory. <laughs> now, I said Bryn Lucas was down on the grid. That like might right not be Bryn. We'd, we'll get back to you on yeah, that. But he is right somewhere the down there. Uh, whether he's in his Easter Bunny suit, we'll find out in a moment or two, uh, because it is a very busy grid indeed, uh, which is great to see. And uh, some of the teams entering into the spirit of Easter, coping as well with what is now an increasingly chilly Alton Park. And with the amount of rain that's fallen, lots of people are a bit damp and cold, but staying to look forward to a great race. Right, let's get down to the grid. Hello, Brent. Yeah, here I am with, with Darren actually on the grid. See Dan's in the car just there. I've chatted to you first of all, Darren, because it's been uh, an eventful first race for you. Uh, yeah, no, it was... Um real Leibner race one um, a lot of people were really uncertain of a lot of things and uh, yeah I thought I was actually pretty happy with uh, the job that I ended up doing um, quite tricky conditions just kind of focus on the job I had to do and yeah I thought we came in I think it was P5 came in at so I was really happy with that and then yeah Dan just did a stellar job really. yeah quick word about Dan as well because he yeah. was he was really fighting wasn't he at the front just there and he, he's gonna be battling out with Jules on the start line too oh yeah absolutely I mean I just you know, just so he doesn't hear. Um, I can't commend Dan enough. I think he's one of the best drivers I've ever met, not just in skill, but uh, in personality as well. And I just think he's a real credit to BMW, um, who themselves have just supported us so much over the last few months. So really a big thank you to both of them. It's been fantastic. Great stuff. Best of luck today, Darren. There you go, Darren Lung just there. Dan Harper, what a great first race he had in the championship. Just look at the quality of the cars and the drivers we have around here as well on this grid because there's yeah. Rob Bell, there's Martin Kutcher, but there's, there's actually just here Jules Gounon's teammate right behind him. That's a teammate in GT World Challenge Europe. Uh, Marcello is just there, so there's going to be a big fight going on for these two. And then we're straight to see the Beach Dean car back as well with Andrew Howard and Ross Gunn starting the race here. Now, let's just quick, uh, take a quick run down to the 78. Sandy Mitchell in the Hurricane. This is the Evo two which is the third incarnation of the hurricane and sandy was saying they're finding it really hard to kind of uh, get to grips with the car and see if i can quickly doorstep sandy very quickly sandy let's just cut this out here sandy it was a, a tough first one you said to me before the race how how tricky this car is to to get uh, a handle of uh, yeah i mean it's uh, like every time you know you get a bit of a new car or a big upgrade package sometimes it just takes a little bit of time to get fully into the window so yeah, just felt like we missed the mark slightly in the first race. Um, the, the conditions are super tricky, so um, it's definitely not easy. 
Um, sorry, I've got someone in my ear. Uh, <laughs> and then you've got tricky conditions as well. Again, like you hadn't raced one. I, I guess you've learned a fair bit from the tyres in that first race. Yeah, definitely. Um, the conditions are kind of similar now where it's rained and it looks like it's going to get a bit drier, but it's quite a bit worse now than it was at the start of race one. So it's definitely going to be interesting uh, at the start of this race. Always is. Good luck, Sandy. There you go. So uh, an amazing calibre of drivers. The front eight in especially just mind-blowingly good. I'm going to head down to GT4. So, Addis, I'll let you take it over from here and I'll run. I'll get my, uh, my skates on. We'll hold you to that. Right. Enjoy your round, Brent. Of course, it's downhill towards the GT4 fraternity uh, as they are at Deer Leap. Then he's going to run all the way back up the hill. Now, what about this as a potential winning car? Raffaele Marcello, he starts third on the grid. Uh, the first race was uh, an outstanding one. And not only was it uh, not only was it a great lead battle, but also it was very, very close for third place. Uh, so close was it for third that it ended up being uh, a photo finish. The gap was officially 29 thousandths of a second. McLaren ahead of Mercedes, but that, courtesy of TSL Sports Timing, the official timing service for British GT, that was the official uh, photo camera. As the uh, finish line camera as they came across yeah, the line. Okay, so not I'll only did the transponders the confirm 29,000, so that was the, the camera shot of it. That is how close GT3 racing is around here. Ross Gunn, one of the stars of that earlier race, Andrew Howard, who was also a bit of a hero himself, uh, peering into the car. And uh, another driver who was very impressive yesterday, uh, sorry, Saturday, I should say, in qualifying, uh, was Charles Clark, new to British GT this year. He's in GT4, he's also in conversation with Bryn. Well, Charles, earlier on we had. Well, I suppose for Saturday for you, uh, two amazing uh, qualifying sessions for both drivers. Race one didn't quite go to plan. Yeah, Saturday was great. Um, me and Jack both qualified on pole, um, so it was a great start to the weekend. But um, yeah, race one wasn't the best for us. Um, but again, we're starting from P1, so just want to hand the car over to Jack in a good position um, and hopefully stay out of trouble. And what do you think about this, these conditions? Alton Park always seems to throw out the conditions question. Yeah, it's very difficult, especially with um, 18 GT3 cars trying to get through as well. Um, especially when we're on slicks in the first race, it was pretty difficult. Um, but starting with all the pros now, um, hopefully it'll be a bit better. Best of luck, all right? Thank you very much. Let's take a little stroll a bit further back as well, because there's a couple of other drivers I think we should try and uh, grab a quick word with. I mean, what an incredible grid we have as well in GT4. There is a gap missing here from one car that uh, couldn't make it out to 17. They, uh, they couldn't quite get out on track, unfortunately, uh, today. So let's just take a little quick trip a bit further down. and will see how far I can get before you lose me. In fact, let's spin back here and go and speak to Seb Hopkins because different car for him this time round. Last year, we saw him very much in the, uh, the Porsche. Seb, very, very different car for you this time out. I was saying to you before, before the race, how quickly have you adapted to it? Uh, I think as a team we've done a really good job so far. I think um, yeah, I've I've got so I've just got some radio. Um, but, you know, I think uh, so far we've done a good job. I think I've been uh, learning quickly, so just need it all to piece together now. And, and so for yourself and the team, I mean, your thoughts through race one. Then talk us through the the issues. Yeah, just, we just had a bit of contact. Josh had a bit of contact uh, the first few laps, which uh, caused us to DNF due to a leakage. Um, uh, which is a really big shame. It really hasn't kicked the start of the season very well, but um, hopefully we can come back in this one. You said to me earlier on that your goal for this season was just to win the championship and really that you had to win the championship. Is there really that much pressure on you? I think, you know, there's expectations. I think, you know, we've all got, as a team, high expectations and I think we can, uh, we can match them. So, um, yeah, it's a long season ahead, so we'll see. Certainly is. Best of luck, Seb. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Cheers. So you've heard from the drivers, uh, the rain is falling yet again because almost you can set your watch by this. If a race is about to start today, say somebody turns on the tap. Two minutes to go to the start now, Joe Osborne. We had a really fantastic first race. Race two's got quite a lot to live up to, but look at this grid. Some of these factory drivers right at the pointy end and on a road that is getting damper all the time. This is going to be quite a first few laps. Yeah, and like race one, we saw it dry out because the sun was out and yeah. the ambient was high, but it's really dropped now and it's a lot gloomier. This is a definite wet race that we're starting with. The other one was questionable, in my opinion. The only thing that's going to dry the track is potentially the egos of these GT3 drivers because <laughs> there's going to be a lot, a lot of wide shoulders and elbows out into turn one. 
We saw, I don't think, any love lost between the front row between Gunon and Harper. We saw the penalty to Harper. We saw Gunon having to break. I spoke to him after the race. He said he was going to go past that GT4 car. Harper disagreed. So they've got a chance to set with the score quite quickly into into lap one, into turn one as well. But I think the rain's going to get even heavier as well. So I think if teams have gone conservative and kind of left the car in a middle ground setup wise, they're going to feel the pain later in the race. Anyone that's gambled, take the roll bars off, soften the dampers, even the springs. As it gets wetter and wetter and you need to generate that energy, I think these guys will really then start to come to the front. Let's get a bit of admin out of the way. It is a one-hour race. There will be mandatory pit stops for every car. In GT3, it's 70 seconds line to line, and they will come between 22 and 32 minutes of the race. In GT4, they are 100 second pit stops, and they come between 28 and 38 minutes of the race. But if you are in the top three, you then carry what is now known as a pit stop compensation time into the next race. So the winning car, Johnny Adams, will take 10 seconds extra in the pits, seven seconds for the Ross Gunn, Andrew Howard, Aston Martin, and five for the Marcus Clatton, Morgan Tilbrook, uh, McLaren. And as far as the GT4 cars are concerned, as the green flag is waved and the car's set off now, uh, similar concept. Again, it will be the top three finishers that carry the extra time. So uh, 10 seconds go to Matt Nicol Jones and Will Moore as the winners, seven to Eric Evans and Matt Cowley, their teammates who were second, and third, gaining five seconds uh, extra in the pits will be the Raceway Motorsport, Michael Kreese, Tom Holland, Junetta. That is one of two cars, we are told, starting on slicks. But now, in fact, we've got one car heading into the pit lane. It could be one of those Raceway Junettas, in actual point of fact. I can only see the back of it from here. You can see the cars at Cascade, and this is the grid. So Jules Gounon and Dan Harper will lock out the front row of the grid. The second row, Raphael Marciello and Marvin Kirchhofer. And then row three of the grid is going to be Ross Gunn and the race one winner, Johnny Adam. Then Sandy Mitchell lines up alongside Ron Bell. All of these star names in international GT racing. Sam Neary next with Will Tregertha rounding out the top 10. 11th, we find Marcus Clatton. 12th, Callum McLeod. 13th on the grid is going to be uh, Martin Plowman. Ewan Hankey will start 14th. And then James Kale and Chris Froggart are on the eighth row. 56 it is indeed in the uh, pit lane as Michael O'Brien and Oliver Webb will start 17th and 18th on this grid. Then in GT4, Charles Clark on pole, Tom Wrigley lining up alongside him. 21st on the grid, Tom Rawlings and Esme Hawkey would have been there, but that car starting from the pit lane after damage in race one. 23rd, Stuart Middleton, Seb Hopkins in the now sorted Aston Martin, 24th ahead of Dan Ball, the 2020 GT4 British champion, and Josh Rowledge alongside him. 27th is where you find James Wallace and Tom Holland for Raceway Motorsport alongside. Then Lewis Plato and Michael Broadhurst. Experienced drivers both could have them back on the grid. Eric Evans and Matt Nicol Jones, the top two cars in GT4 in race one. A long way back on this grid, but ahead of Chris Sulkeld and Bobby Trundley from Team Brit. And then it's going to be James Townsend who rounds out the grid. Well, we are told only one green flag lap. We've got this. Uh, one Janessa number 56 now starting after car 80 from the pit lane. But, Joe, this road is getting wetter all the time, at least on the back part of the circuit. Whereas over here, the, the rain has stopped for the moment. Nobody can second guess what's going to come. Yeah, a million percent. It's so much wetter in that end of sector one. Look how dry it is there. You can't, there's no spray whatsoever. Never seen it split so much at Alter Park. It's not the longest lap. I assume that's why the lake's that end, because it obviously rains a lot more over there. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, the drivers are going to have to get on top of that quite quickly. One formation lap, as you said, that doesn't give these guys much time. Tire temp, brake temp, even to get their eye in. This is going to be a fiery start. I can feel it in my waters. Well, Silverstone is a circuit, for example, that's always noted for having its own uh, microclimate. Alton Park, you're right, isn't one, but Ian Loggy's got his woolly hat on just in case. Ian Loggy, although he's a Scot, he does live near Alton Park these days. He's based in Tarpoli. So the cars come down towards Lodge Corner. You're looking back then from Jules Gounon's uh, D2 liveried Mercedes. That car with the livery inspired from the Mercedes uh, CLKs of FIA GT 1997 era. We're about to go racing at Alton Park then. Round two of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship is go. Jules Gounon leads the way. Dan Harper tries to brave it out on the outside line. Down towards Old Hall corner. Side by side for third. Rafael Marcello and Marvin Kirchhofer. Lello goes third in the Mercedes. Kirchhofer drops back into fourth. Look on board from Jules Gounon's car. Through the spray, through the gloom. He leads. He's making a break. He's got better visibility, but also he's the pioneer. He's the first one to discover the grip at every corner. 
It's going to be difficult. This spray is going to be like a wall of water. You cannot see anything when you're sat in this car. Imagine waking up with conjunctivitis, having Vaseline smeared over your glasses. That's how it feels. These guys are feeling their way around. Because you look back, you can't see the headlights as the speed goes up. Marcello around the outside. There is grip up there, but Harper's in that wide, wide BMW. He's going to run him out of road, but gives Ooh. him enough. Big slide. Marcello's got the run. That was a great move all the way around the outside at Shell. People do say there's a bit more grip in the wet on the outside. And Raphael Marcello, who's never raced at Alton Park prior to this weekend, didn't even test either. Uh, he's learning fast. He's up to second. So it is going to be on lap one then as they come over hilltop down towards his lops a mercedes amg one two as you see the whole field pouring through his lops over the brow and now down towards the uh, right left right of his lops and into nickerbrook corner they come riding on board with number 36 this the dto motorsport josh rowledge driven mclaren in gt4 comes then now through his lops right and left and then right into nickerbrook so up towards Druids on lap one, Jules Gounon leads Raphael Marcello at Alton Park. There's a sentence I never thought I'd say. In third place, Marvin Kirkhoff ahead of Dan Harper, who's dropping back a little bit into the clutches of Ross Gunn, then Johnny Adam, the race one winner. And remember, of the cars in that leading group, his is the one with the heaviest pit stop compensation time. It's really interesting to see that BMW struggling to get its power down at the moment. All these cars have got really sophisticated traction control systems using many inputs, working out how much power to give the car at any given moment. But that BMW is struggling to get it down in an orderly fashion. And look how much wetter it is as you come into turn one. Spray comes up, Ross Grant looking to the inside. Not going to quite get the run on him there, but really showing an intent. And look at the first two. They have checked out completely. Guna Martial obviously have won everything that we've got to offer them in GT racing, but I think Nürburgring experience, these yeah, mixed true. conditions, I think they just are so at home in their machinery and they're really, really proving that fact in front of us right now. Well, Jules Gounon led at the end of lap one by 2.899 seconds. However, Rafael Marchiello doesn't just want to win the race, doesn't just want to win the championship, and off the road goes Sam Neary. He also wants to prove he's top dog Mercedes driver, but Sam Neary going backward at high speed. Now, thankfully, he's not going to hit anything solid. However, what we now need to see is how easy or otherwise it's going to be to get that big, heavy Mercedes AMG GT3 off very wet, friction-free grass. Looked like it was Tregertha on his inside, this Lamborghini in shot with the yellow on the inside. Couldn't see any contact, but going side by side through islands not easy, especially in the wet. He's done a good job to get it off that wet grass. He's now got to pray for a safety car, but that's going to be a long, long afternoon for Sam and his yeah. dad Richard in that uh, car. But as I said, Harper really backing these guys up at the moment. I just pray for him that the car's going to come to him. Maybe the tyres weren't as hot as the other guys out the tyre ovens. He just needs a lap or two to get into it. But look at the gap already. Mark, you can't see Goon on in shot. You can barely see um, Kershaw. And then Harper's in shot now. I think Gunn's going to get quite impatient because he's going to then get worried about Johnny Adam behind him. And that whole Constantine effect is going to come into uh, action pretty soon, I think. So down they come then towards Lodge Corner. This is the fight that's going on now for uh, fourth place, which is Dan Harper ahead of Ross Gunn, factory drivers both. See McLaren, you see Mercedes, then McLaren, 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 McLaren turning into Lodge Corner. McLaren is the boat car, and it's the same in GT4. Look, McLaren, 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 the top three as they drop down towards Lodge. Number 90, Charles Clark, then uh, new to British GT this year, one of the front runners last season in the Porsche sprint challenge for the Cayman 718s. Of course, his dad used to race a Dodge Viper, amongst other things, in uh, British GT. Side by side here, look, diving down towards Cascades on the inside line there. Martin Plowman on the outside line, Will Tregertha. Martin Plowman stays ahead of the McLaren. Jules Gounon's lead up to three and a half seconds. He's got two extra races worth of experience around here. Then the man that's chasing him, Raphael Marciello, is through the gloom. The battle remains here for 10th place. Martin Plowman just ahead. Really, really good move there. He must have had a super drive out of turn one. I would probably guess Dragath has used the exit curb, spun the, the rears up and just not got the traction because it's not a big break zone into Cascades, even in the wet. So that was a good move. And again, that's freed him up some space. You just find the ebb and the flow of the race. You get one car holding four or five cars up. And if you can get clear, you can then run in some clear space and some clear air clutch and front damage. He's obviously hit the back of Sandy Mitchell there. That bonnet's got four pins. The front two are definitely gone, and the rear two aren't going to do much of that. If that lasts much more than half a lap, I'd be surprised. It's hard. If I was clutter now, you've got to stay out and hope it stays down, but I think that's going to jettison up into the stratosphere as he probably goes over uh, into Water Tower here. But uh, it, it must have happened under braking. It didn't look like a huge impact, but enough to break the bonnet of that uh, Enduro McLaren anyway. Well, let's see how it all pans out. Jules Gounon has just gone across the line. Way, way clear now from Raffaele Marciello in second place. Third is going to be Marvin Kirchhofer's uh, Gulf-inspired liveried McLaren. 
and then Dan Harper, best of the rest, fourth. Ross Gunn, fifth in the Aston Martin. Here they come. Sixth over the line is Johnny Adam. Gap back seventh, and he's going to be Rob Bell. In eighth place, Sandy Mitchell. Ninth is Marcus Clutton. And in tenth place, Martin Plowman. In GT4, number 90, McLaren. Charles Clark still leads the way here. Tom Wrigley chasing after him. And the uh, incident between Michael Kreese and Tom Holland's Ginetta. Tom Holland at the wheel and 86 of James Townsend will be investigated after the race. That happened on the first lap of the race. Yeah, Clutton has lost completely the whole of that bonnet. So he's uh, gone from the McLaren Evo Tour already with his own upgrade. The problem is I have seen the McLaren use, lose that in the race before. And although it's just a duct for the front radiator, it really disrupts the airflow. And it, it's got potential to overheat, which sounds a bit perverse losing bodywork but everything is so funny much great move to the inside here sorry from the dto gt4 the aston hangs it around the outside and gets the drive and then suddenly you see the merc gt4 now on the drive what's we going to do well he's left or right he can see the merc darted around he's gone to the middle just to stop that run he lives to fight another day but uh yeah i think we have to keep an eye on clutter without that bonnet it's really hard and you see neary now in the middle of all this yeah giving us a flavor of what the gt3 gt4 fighting is going to be like well sam neary will certainly be a man to watch in this as will dad because we know that it's a quick car both of them are good in the wet uh, and sam neary is a lot better a driver it might seem odd saying this being that he's been off the road but he is a lot calmer a lot smoother a lot faster a lot more controlled than he was a few seasons ago so that is a car that should make progress you're right joe in what you said earlier a safety car certainly will help and i'll be surprised if with 53 minutes to go in these conditions we didn't have some sort of interruption as there look number 18 porsche in gt4 dan vaughan makes his way through on the inside to gain one spot but he's got 62 mustang right up behind him then that car with matt nickel jones at the wheel but one gt4 in race one so it cops for a longer time in the pits on the pit stop and the rain is back with us at the exit of lodge corner we're based just between lodge and dear lee and it is hammering it down once more so the road is getting wetter and wetter but every lap is different from the previous one in terms of the amount of rain it seems yeah and we're seeing that with the lap times normally the pros will keep their lap times within a couple of tenths quite easily in the dry when the conditions are more level but we're seeing a huge swing like a couple of seconds so it's really really difficult for these guys so we're going to sit on board with this car here we're going to see the rain pounding down windscreen wiper flat out into turn one breaking slightly off the line the racing line gets very slippery all the rubber and oil is worn out so you tend to stick off it don't touch that exit curb the paint's super slippy down into cascades we'll be looking ahead here he wants to hold it to the right as much as he can to try and get a run on this aston martin in front he's gone in a bit narrow so he gets this gain on the way in but i think he's going to lose on the way out to that car in front just starts to flow away from him you can see the battle in front of him just need to take a little bit of a chill pill work out where he's going to be stronger into the fast fast island corner fair bit of understeer which isn't the worst thing a little bit of oversteer as he gets on the throttle just to make myself look stupid into shell really bank get it back in unwind the lock let's go so he's definitely got a bit of pace over this aston martin which in turn to be fair i think is being held up himself so it's going to be difficult to see who's going to make the move but look at these cars still using so much curb in the wet so sophisticated all the traction control systems even the damping these days is so so good it lets the car ride it without really offering too much disruption but the rain's getting seriously seriously heavy in this middle sector i think we're going to probably be two or three laps away from starting to see these little rivers forming where the cars just start to aquaplane which is fine for a little while but if they start to get larger and larger then it does get a little bit larry and i don't think we're a million miles away from this when you look at the spray that's being chucked out yeah. you can barely see that aston already as soon as you get into that sort of 120 130 kilometers an hour the water just feels like it's being absolutely sprayed at you marcus clutton into the pit lane you were concerned a couple of laps back about the damage at the front well 77 mclaren marcus clutton has pitted I don't think this is for tyres because it'll be on the right set, the right compound, it'll be on wet, so it must be a legacy of the damage. As now, Josh Rowledge dives to the inside line. Um, bit of contact? Yeah, definitely on the left rear for the uh, for the McLaren, sorry. Let's check his steering wheel. Sometimes knock the alignment out. There's not really a straight line here, as you see that damage. And it's just done that you can see the front corner yeah. there over the headlight. So that would have been the, the Lambo on the brakes, I think, of Mitchell and him on the brakes. And it's just gone all the way through. Probably hit the exhaust on that Lambo by the looks of the shape of that damage. As we see Gunnar just strolling on a, uh, a Monday afternoon stroll in the park. It's beautiful for him, isn't it? He hasn't seen another car since he put his foot down as the lights went out on the start. No, exactly. Jules, uh, it's good to have him here because he was in hospital a few weekends ago after a sizable off at the Nürburgring. Uh, but uh, he discharged himself 
well, he was allowed out of, in fairness, hospital pretty swiftly. I think he was only in overnight and uh, said on Saturday, yeah, I'm fine. Got a bit of a headache, but that might be down to her and gestured at Michelle Gatting, his racing driver girlfriend, who rolled her eyes like, yeah, I've heard that one before, thanks very much. But uh, certainly showing no ill effects of a sizable off. He tripped over a back marker in the opening LNS race of the season. Now, the gap is coming down, though. It was three seconds. It is now 2.4. Jules Gounon last time around did a 44-7 Marcello a 44-0 with an absolute best in the middle sector so as uh, Raffaele Marcello pounds on the lead gaps coming down you're on board here with Sandy Mitchell he is eighth Rob Bell's McLaren is ahead of him as they dive into Old Hall Corner another big snap of Ames on the apex there as we're on that slippy racing line I was mentioning earlier let's see the differences I was speaking to Sandy a fair bit after race one this new Evo 2 for the Lambo they're just getting their heads around it not quite been given the bot they think they deserve power-wise. Let's see if that McLaren pulls away in the straight line on the way to Ireland. It looks pretty even to me, so I'm not going to go with Sandy's argument on that. It looks strong on the brakes. Aero looks good. All that rework of the bodywork. Every single panel's new on that Hurricane this year. It's meant to mimic the STO, so uh, not my cup of tea if I'm allowed to say personally, but I'm sure it's uh, popular in different parts of the world. But he looks like he's got that pace over the Evo version of the McLaren, so Rob has been obviously around for a long, long time. I've worked with him. He's one of the best guys I've ever, ever driven alongside, so he's not going to be easy to get around, but you can again see he's really holding up Mitchell, especially, I think, in these more mid-speed corners. The Lambo just seems to have a little bit more front end, and you can roll the speed in as we go to the outside shot of that really see the rotation the Lambo's got. You can close all the way up. That McLaren was loose there on throttle again, so I'm sure Rob's on top of it, but there's 12 traction control settings. The higher the number, the more intrusion he'll be getting, and he'll be playing around with those settings. The team Optimum Motorsport will be able to advise him of what they're seeing on the live telemetry, so it's not all down to the driver. The, the teams will be able to advise with what they think, but obviously the guy behind the wheel has got the best feel at any given time. The lead gap is down to 1.8 seconds now. So it's gone from three to 1.8 in the space of two laps with uh, Raffaele Marcello having just done the fastest lap of the race, six tenths quicker than Jules Gounon. So it is game on for the race lead. In third place is Marvin Kirchhoff, and then fourth, fifth, sixth have just gone past Dan Harper, Ross Gunn, Johnny Adam. And then the next battle is all rather McLaren and Lamborghini based, isn't it? Rob Bell. Uh, ahead of Sandy Mitchell, ahead of Martin Plowman. That's the lead car, but you can see the way that Marcello is catching now. Although on this lap, is Jules Gunn on any quicker in sector one? No, Marcello again, another tenth pull back. And it doesn't look like uh, Marcello's losing time, as everyone else is just going a little bit slower than their best. The last three laps, Marcello has gone quicker every single lap. I just wonder, I know the uh, two C's guys that run that Gunon car, I just wonder if they've got a bit stung. They, they thought they went too much of a wet setup in race one. I wonder if they've now gone too much of a dry setup for race two. But Gunon is really, really struggling to hold that gap as we're going to start catching our first GT4 car as well. It wasn't long ago, I fear, that somebody said it's like an easy Monday afternoon drive in the park. It's getting a bit less easy because, as you rightly say, the gap is coming down sector by sector. And there is traffic. And there is Raffaele Marciello. He's all fired up behind Jules Gunon. And that gap is coming down, hand over fist. Yeah, my bad, it was a bad call on that one, so I apologise <laughs> for the commentator's curse. He's been lucky with that Ginetta. I don't think he'll lose any time whatsoever. Marciano, however, has to get him on the brakes. He's a bit compromised into the last corner. Not as bad as if it was dry, but Marciano just seems to be monstrum on the brakes. Yeah. The two brake zones, we've had real good visuals of them together. Just looks like he can brake 10 metres later. Same cars, Mercedes AMG GT3, different teams. Two Cs operates the leading car, Ram Racing, the second place car, Ram Racing, uh, Dan Shufflebottom has given way to this man, John Ferguson, who has now bought it, or his family business has bought it. Tim Sugden brought in as the team manager. Uh, and John said to me this morning, no, I'm here just as a driver. I don't have to think about it as a business. I've got other people looking at the business side of it and running the team. I drive. Uh, and he reckons that he has 22 minutes to muck it up, but Raffaele Marciello has 38 to restore the balance. But right now, not only is Raffaele doing a really good job, but John drove well in challenging conditions, of course, in that first race, which means they make a good combination. Yeah, exactly. And uh, they're both penalty free, which will be interesting to see how it translates to the rest of the grid. But I can't see Gunon being able to hold Marciello off just on pure yeah. pace. We know it's difficult to overtake. Go on board. I love this on board. Eyes are focused, nice and relaxed in the arm. See his elbow, there's no tension there. Going into the Knickerbrook chicane, so hard on the brakes, going to turn to the right. Should be about 90 degrees of steering lock in. Same to the left, hook the curb up on the left as well. Need to drag it over to the left. His head will look right as he turns right, and then he gets it in. He's probably just looking at where he's been strongest. From the, the bits we've seen, I would say that last lap, the braking into Lodge, even though he was compromised, 
by the Janetta. He looks strong. Loggy looks a little bit nervous, but I think Loggy would fancy himself against Ferguson in a yeah. fight. So obviously he would rather be in front for track position. But if those positions swap and as uh, Jewel can stay within two or three seconds, let's say worst case, I still think Loggy would fancy himself for a decent result here this afternoon. And although Jules Grunon's career has largely been around uh, GT cars, Raffaele was uh, a real single-seater gun in his early days. Formula 3 Euro Series champion, uh, moved on to GP2, but it is as a factory Mercedes driver he's really made his name. And now, through the traffic, goes Jules Grunon, moves ahead of Esme Hawke, he's pit lane starting Ginetta. And now Raffaele Marchiello will do likewise, blast through on the run in towards Denton. You can see how gloomy it is on that shot, can't you? So the driver's coping with limited visibility, limited traction and I suspect that the AMs will want their pro driver to stay out as long as possible here, so this battle is going to go on and on. Yeah, definitely, and that gloom we're looking at is the weather front coming towards us, so it doesn't look like it's going to brighten up any time soon. We're definitely, in the next five minutes, probably cancelling any chance of slick tyres being used in this race, but these two, I'm saying that Gunon is slowing up, he's definitely not. These guys last lap were one and a half seconds quicker than anyone else around them. They're now 13 seconds clear of uh, Kershoff in third place. So these guys have really got to work out even team orders, two factory drivers. Yeah. Is it worth going on even holding up Marcia? Different teams, I'm, I'm not suggesting it's going to be easy, but they'd be better just to crack on and make, make it the win between those two rather than trip over each other. In GT4, there might be some tripping over in a moment because Dan Vaughan in the Porsche, very determined as they went up Clay Hill there to try to find a way through the traffic. He has uh, got the McLaren there just ahead of him. Behind is the Lewis Plato driven BMW 61. At the back of that queue is Eric Evans in the Ford Mustang. As down here, look, comes number 23, Seb Hopkins. Diving down now to lodge them. The GT4 battle is now being caught by the overall race leaders. So through the gloom, through the traffic, lights are flashing. It feels very spa 24 hours like this now, doesn't it? Jules Gounon leads Raffaele Marciello out of Deer Leap. And this will put 10 laps in the book. 42 and a half minutes to go over the line. Wipers on. Traffic to the right, traffic to the left. Gounon dives through. Marciello dives through. And that means they go ahead of Chris Salkeld. Uh, Century Motorsport run BMW GT4 spec car, but there are still one, two, three, four, five, six at least back markers to clear. So Jules Gounon's got to be on his toes here. And they're too wide, and a lot of the time Gounon's been lucky that BMW's coming over. Look at the run he's got, nowhere to go for Marcello. Has to lift off, breathe off the throttle, and he's going to get through. But at the moment, he's just following Gounon. There's no chance to manipulate a space. That's what. At the moment, the frustration will be for him inside that car. A lot of Alton Park is two car wide at maximum. So even if there is that run, there's not the chance to get it going. But this other on board we've got here, we can see he's working hard. Normally this Mercedes is quite docile, quite placid when we watch the onboards. But in the wet, he is working that car pretty hard. But he's obviously hustling it in a way that he's confident with it. Let's just look at the differences on traction. Gunon looks like he had a good drive there. He's getting around one of the Arturo GT4s. It's going to be so difficult as these guys put the worst fake smiles on possible because <laughs> one, they're watching these pros hustle these 500,000 pound cars that they might have to pay the ba uh, damage bill for. But also, in, within the next 15 minutes, they're going to be driving those cars. So, uh, yeah, I'd say it's been a, a relatively uneventful trip through those GT4s, considering how bad it looked like it could get with them tripping over each other. It's all been quite good so far. Sometimes they share a car, sometimes they race against one another, and right now, lapping Dan Vaughan's Cayman is Raffaele Marcello down towards Lodge Corner. The rain has eased a bit over here, but enough has fallen to make the road still very treacherous indeed. And as Joe made the point a little while ago, they're 13 seconds, 13 seconds up the road from everybody else. Marvin Kirkhofer is still third, that's John Ferguson pointing at his car as it goes past the pits. Dan Harper's BMW runs fourth, Ross Gans Aston fifth, Johnny Adams. Mercedes is in sixth. So sixth and with 10 seconds extra to serve in the pits. They need a safety car in the second stint as Jules Gounon dives up the inside. Now remember that car was out of the top three in the first race as was the Ram Racing Mercedes behind. So they will serve only the mandatory pit stop time, nothing extra spray it's kicking up it's yeah it's stopped raining a little bit and the sun's come out tiny bit oh. as we see Marcello on the grass please keep it on keep it on the barrier comes close a little bit of gravel he's going to slap the barrier maybe get round it Scandinavian flick and he survived oh. that splitter looked okay from the bouncers I saw and he's going to be able to get clear he's flashing his headlights at the Mustang I don't know if that was the car at fault for him going wide or it was the Mercedes it was hard to see where he was on track but that is a really good illustration of what happens in multi-class racing
but if it can bite the best, it can bite anybody. Uh, so Raffaele Marciello doesn't make many mistakes, but a tiny off there, and it could have had serious consequences. Right, damage inspection. He's got a bit of grass in the front, of course, having scooped all that up as he ran wide at Island Bend. But the most significant thing is he's still in the race. Yes, the gap would have widened from six tenths of a second, but it could have been a whole lot worse. Bites the car out of Nickerbrook, blasts up the hill now. Let's see how he got there, Joe. Well, he should be on the outside as his shot comes in. It's all by himself. Yeah. Got a little bit greedy, used the apex curve, and the apex curve ends very abruptly on the inside. It looks like he hooked the left wheels onto the money part. Wow, that wow. was so, so lucky. The Mustang checked up like Marcello did in race one, to be fair. So on board, for me, he uses too much curb on the left. Watch the curb, comes into shot, and then it ends. And I think he just grabs the water on the inside of that. It does well. He doesn't panic here. Look at that tire barrier coming up on our right. Almost flicks it to the right. Round. He's got 108 degrees of lock on. In between two GT4 cars, lives to fight another day. The world's fastest flymo is still in second place. So the gap is 4.3 seconds. Jules Gounon breathes a sigh of relief. And Raffaele Marciello now has to fight back. Now, what has that done to the gap between him and Marvin Kirchhoff for nine and a half seconds? It therefore is reduced a touch. This car is still clear in GT4. Charles Clark's McLaren, the Optima Motorsport car from pole position, leads the way. And it doesn't have the pit stop compensation time to factor in. It does have 14 seconds extra, though, because of it being uh, a silver graded driver pairing. So if you're a silver-silver partnership in GT4, you take another 14 seconds in the pits. Second in GT4 uh, is a Pro-Am car. Now that is the uh, entry number 29 of Tom Wrigley and Ian Goff that doesn't have those 14 seconds and the gap between them is 1.6. In other words, it is advantage number 29. Now the GT3 cars can now pit. Their pit window is open but probably nobody wants to come in yet because that's why you have a pro, to maximise your chances as an amp. Keep them out there. Yeah, exactly that. And the pros are battling. Obviously, one of the Mustangs going straight through the Nickerbrook chicane. Didn't look like anyone was around him. So I'm not quite sure what his excuse for that will be. Johnny Adam out on the grass. Just when you get them all, oh, then came across and made contact with the BMW. I hope that photographer's OK. Looked like he did a good job of diving out of the way. But I'm a little bit worried about the barrier damage there in terms of a safety car. But it looked like Johnny Adam got pushed wide. And as he came back over for the racing line, kind of left the Century BMW nowhere to go. Quite an odd place to go off, hence why there's no tyres in front of the barrier there. But hopefully uh, the BMW, because it hit it so square, might be able to pop it in reverse and get going. He's got going, but hopefully he's not leaking a load of fluid. Not that's going to make the biggest difference when it's that wet, but Ugh. shredding a lot of carbon fibre. I think that splitter just went over its under its own front wheels. So there's debris on the racetrack now, yeah. in addition to everything else. That's Lewis Plato at the wheel, the former Radical and Porsche racer. We've seen him in Mercedes, of course, in this championship in the past. The lead gap now, five seconds. Pit window is open. And Marciello needing to fight back in his last lap, eight tenths slower than Gunon as he's still in the traffic. Yeah, and the teams will be primed as soon as the safety car gets called. They will all box to save time, even if it is getting that slower. I mean, early, as we see Tregartha struggling. <laughs> The difference is so big, but if you get checked up, that's a second and a half loss done. And you've just got to move on. Um, but yeah, I think that would be the day done for Plato in that BMW. Yeah. There's a huge amount of damage. It's one way to make that grill look a bit better, I think, though, on the BMW. So uh, maybe it would be an Evo for it. But uh, again, Gunon's just lost another second, getting stuck behind the Optimum car. And again, that's a GT4 leader. These are two leaders. Neither of them are slow, but the speed difference just makes it. The Optimum car's done a mega job staying to the left. Shows Jewel, I want you to go on my right. They both can go flat out up the hill with minimal slash no time loss whatsoever. Photographer's all right down at Nickerbrook, so he's uh, upright again, snapping happily as Jules Gounon now has a clear road ahead. And look, there's hardly any rain now. There's a little bit with the wipers still on, but it's a much, much drier surface compared to what he had earlier on in the day. So Jules Gounon comes into Lodge Corner. The race has got 35 and a half minutes, and they are still on the clock, and he accelerates out of dear lead. So Jules Gounon then, on his own, he's put that lap on the GT4 leader, Charles Clark who in turn is being chased by Tom Wrigley. There is Raffaele Marciello, whose lap is a 44.6. He's lapping quicker than Gunon once again. Yeah, he's got that 10th on him, hasn't he? Quite easy to turn the pace on. I feel under braking, but then when he got close, I was amazed that he, he wasn't able to get closer to him for longer. I don't know if it was the dirty air or the spray, or even if he was just happy to hold station on that one as we cut to the Sky Tempesta McLaren of Chris Fogger. So he's got, he's got the actual arm, 
but you may be noticing the blade's gone. Yeah. Um, so he's got a very clean single inch that he can look <laughs> through, but the rest of it doesn't look particularly pleasant, and he's actually going slowly. He's uh, he's see. given up on that one, which I kind of don't blame him. There's a heated screen which stops it misting up, but yeah, I think the problem is when you if you're challenging for the win, maybe your ego would let you carry on, but when you're a little bit further back, that probably is the right thing to do for safety. So, I mean probably turn the arm off because it's probably going to score a mark in that uh, windscreen in a little while. I can see his eyes are on stalks and I'm, I'm not surprised in all honesty. Spare wise, I've, I've never had this issue so I'm not quite sure what McLaren would do in terms of getting a spare wiper for them. Hopefully it should be a 30 second fix as we've seen Rob Bell pit. When you're in that position where Rob was kind of in that seventh or eight, it's worth pitting a little bit different to everyone else I think because if you follow everyone in at the same time, you're going to finish seventh or eighth most probably. So you might as well gamble on a safety car or people getting held up, for example. So I don't think that's the uh, the worst idea Optimum Motorsport are doing in that race. So, number one, Mercedes. Then Jules Gounon, who won't do every round. He's got to miss Portimao while he's racing in the IMSA Championship, which he's added to his portfolio this year. He comes across the line to put 15 laps in the book, 33 minutes on the clock, and that is the fastest lap of the race. So now, with uh, the road drying, that seems to be a surface that is more suitable to the setup of this car. Yeah, definitely. And like I said at the start of the program, they thought they went to wet setup in race one, and it dried out and it hurt them. So I wonder if they've gone the other way and got that drier bit. So as it does dry out, the tyres will actually start to bite more, generate more grip, and the energy in that car will be dissipated throughout the chassis in a different way. So all the tools you use to get that grip Hopefully for Jewel that the stiffer roll bars, for example, are letting him get the power down. Definitely looks a bit smoother than when being on the onboard with a Ram Marshall in Mercedes. He's able to get the power down. The car doesn't seem to be so twitchy. Let's see, as he comes out of here, a lot of power, a little bit flick to left, but it's almost intentional to rotate the car around that last part. So again, his onboard that we watched from Saturday was incredible. And now it's wet, should be a bit different, of course, the grip level's lower. But again, he's just so smooth. Look at that, the car is just going exactly where he guides it. A little bit greedy on the throttle again, but as a driver, you'd always rather put a little bit too much throttle on, use the traction control, get a bit of rotation. See all the debris there on the left and the right, actually. Uh, the car's just having to pick their way through. We're gonna go into Druids. This corner is slightly slippy than the rest, different surface. Also, the trees just seem to hold the, a little bit longer over the rise. Again, the car is really quiet. It's all so, so smooth. And smooth is something people talk about a lot, but the main positive of it just looks after the tyre so much more rather than soaring on the wheel, big slides out the corners. So if these guys, which I think they will, will stay on the same wets for their amps, his wet should even be in the best possible condition because of his silky smoothness. It's not about speed as much as what it is, but it, as well as, as you say, having to look after the tyres, look after the machinery, give your amp the best chance. And so many of these pros will tell you that you can win or lose the race courtesy of the amp's pace. Unlock something out of that amp, and it makes a world of difference. As into the pit lane, now that it's open for GT4 cars, comes Charles Clark then, so he will give way to Jack Brown. That's the leading car, don't forget, in GT4. So now, early GT4 stoppers are going to merge with late GT3 stoppers. Staggering the windows isn't really going to have that much of a benefit. Yeah, definitely. So you're going to get those drivers fresh out on track, wanting to get up to speed, but then being bombarded with guys who are already on speed. At the moment, the pit lane's quite quiet, but if you look at the amount of drivers with helmets on, ready to go stood there, I think we're about to get busy, and it's a tight, tight pit lane. So it might seem clear when you come in, but if someone yeah. parks next to you, box you in, and you can't push back, then suddenly you've lost a uh, lot of time that you're just never, ever going to get back. And it's definitely, definitely drying on this last part of the lap, I think. And I mentioned that the rain is falling, though, on the back window of our box, because it's just started to spot again. So. Um the weather gods have got other ideas about this. Raffaele Marciello has now done the fastest lap of the race to take that away from Jules Gounon. That is Dan Harper. There behind him is Ross Gunn in the Aston Martin. And then Johnny Adam, whose Mercedes hasn't really come alive in this race in the way that it did in race one, quirkily. Yeah, and, and Harper's bit of has come alive. Do you remember he had five, six cars stacked behind him? Ross Gunn's always been a second with him, so he's had a quite a frustrating stint. Uh, but Johnny Adam, yeah, he's dropped back a little bit. And again, it's the opposite way around this race, isn't it? The two C cars, the Adam Cottingham car that was so strong in race one, doesn't quite have what Gunon's had and potentially Loggy's going to have once he jumps aboard that number one car. But uh, yeah, the spray's starting to die down a bit. I still don't think there's any chance as we see Gunon pit. Loggy here in front is going to run in, get this changed on. They are changing tyres, but it is for another set of wets. Yeah. So they look like they're brand new. 
I'm saying that because I can see the edge of the tyre blocks. They're very square. As you use a wet tyre, it just rounds the edge of the block off. Gives it slightly less bite. You can see the brakes smoking away. We've got a lot of pit guys now, so it's going to yeah, get very, very busy very quickly. I think this is the lap they've got to do it. Otherwise, the window will close while they're out on track. So uh, in is Gunon. Uh, no, Marcello, I think, has carried on. Yes, Raffaele Marcello has gone through for another lap. So that'll be interesting to see if he's timed it right. Kirkhofer is in. Harper is in. Gunn, Adam, Mitchell, Plowman, Tregertha. They're all in. That's Oli Webb's car uh, making its way towards you now with Andre Borodin at the wheel of it. Sam Neary gives way to Richard Neary, and that car is about to be released as well. Yeah, Marciano is tight on time here. Eight seconds, I think, he's got on top of a normal lap time to okay. get in. The big, big positive is that, again, like race one, we're going to have a, a Marciano versus Loggy lap time, though. So Loggy's out lap versus um, Marciano's in lap. I would guess it's going to be three and a half, four seconds. The last lap, Marciello was only one second behind. So if they have a clean pit stop, I would actually predict to see that Ram car in front of the two C's car. You see the other car, James Cotton, now on board the number four, drop to the floor. You'll see the mechanics push it back as we see Alex West take over from Kershoffer, Darren Lung in the BMW. They've stuck in position quite well, maybe a little bit closer. Two C's pushing back. They've been very kind there. They could have pushed back in front of that Aston, I think, and potentially blocked it. So it's going to be a, a big fight down pit lane as we see a McLaren cut right in front of that car. Marcello in. How much time has he got spare? Yeah, he's fine. He's actually 20 seconds, so it's going to be okay. Look how busy that pit lane is. And Marcello now will actually be in a quieter pit lane as well. So he was absolutely perfect on that. Good call from Ram Racing. Yeah. Feels risky, but sometimes you've got to roll the dice. Otherwise, what's the point of being at the party? So the Jules Gounon pit stop was a 111.2 and similar time for number 91 BMW, where it was a 1 minute 12 pit stop for number 88 McLaren. And you're looking at a minute and 10 as the absolute minimum. But of course, one or two of the cars from the earlier race uh, will have the uh, uh, pit stop compensation time to factor in as well. So there, about to make the way down the pit lane uh, is the now uh, John Ferguson driven Mercedes GT3 pit window is closed don't worry as long as you're in uh, before the window closes you don't have to be out as long as you're in the pits that's fine now there is the race leading car that of uh, Ian Loggy lots of traffic around him but such was the margin that he had over uh, the third place car that's not going to affect but it might affect where that car is relative to 15 which is on its way here it comes so John Ferguson down the pit lane but of course he's not up to speed he will leave the pit lane in a moment there with the lights are flashing is Ian Loggy so has this been the genius call by Ram Racing. It looks like it has because that car, yes, takes over the race lead. Now, John Ferguson has to get up to temperature with the tyres, get to, used to the circuit, but he's pulled a massive gap over Ian Loggy, even though he got a bit nervous there at Cascades. Yeah, I'd say Marcello's pulled the gap if I'm being pedantic about True. who's done it. Yeah. But you saw the Ginetta lunging there of Ferguson. It looked like he was going off himself. So, Loggy got the traffic. Ferguson's already been compromised. They've nearly got the whole, whole straight in between them. So, three to four seconds. Again, I just think that's a Marcello in lap versus a yeah, Loggy out lap, and yeah. that is incredible tactics by by Ram. Roll of the dice, but it wasn't the the riskiest move. But on paper, when you're the engineer going, oh, I've only got 20 seconds spare. What if he has a spin? I'm going to look like a bit of an idiot. You've got to make those decisions. You've got to keep your pro in conditions like this as long as you can, and I think it's really paid dividends already. So now, uh, Ian Loggy versus John Ferguson. Who's going to be the quicker? Well, at the end of this lap, we'll see what the starting gap is going to be. John Ferguson there, still getting himself sort of up to speed. He's being tentative on this outlap, which you can understand. He doesn't want to throw away Marcello's good work. Yeah, he can't be this tentative, though. No. He's lost time to the GT4 Ginetta. The GT4 Berg, that's behind him. That should be eight seconds a lap slower. It's so difficult for the AM. When I've been the pro with the AM, I do everything. When it's my stint and I'm passing over, we have a live onboard, so we see the gap. So seven down to four. He's already lost three seconds in two sectors got to try and prepare the AM as best you can. Some of the teams use live onboard and the drivers will narrate the lap while they're driving during the race with the AM with a headset on saying, this is where I'm braking, going down to this gear. I've tried this, it didn't work. I've tried this, it did work. So when the AM gets in the car, they're already up to speed. They're already running. They don't have an outlap like that. To lose three seconds to another AM, we, c we need to stop it now. Yeah. Marshall will be on the radio screaming, saying, let's get in a rhythm. Three seconds isn't, isn't good enough. So 3.6 is the gap now as they go across the timing line. And we'll see in a moment or two at the end of the first sector on Lakeside Straight. Plus, with traffic ahead of John Ferguson, what 
the gap is going to be. That Mercedes, the GT4 Mercedes, arrives at Cascades pretty committed. Uh, scrabbles around the corner. Michael Broadhurst to the wheel of it. Right, they're coming up towards the end of the first sector. A 27-3 to that point by Ferguson and a 26-4 by Ian Longy. So he's taken nine tenths out in the first third of the lap alone. Yeah, we can really see Ferguson is the car in front of this one. It's going to be two seconds by the time they come through the next sector. Ferguson's struggling with GT4 traffic. The team manager of car 15 to race control. That is John Ferguson's Mercedes. So the leading car, the team manager uh, being summoned to race control and also uh, the Greystone GT Mike Price Callum McLeod Mercedes AMG team manager there to race control. So this story is good to watch on the track, but there's a backstory going on in race control now. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what that is. The the other car, the, the three car, all oh, going through there. <laughs> That's he's terrorised out of the way. A Does little that make bit, it? yeah. And so he's got a bit of clear space now. This is his time to find a rhythm. Uh, spinner there. So that's the uh, Tregurtha Samson car. That'd be Samson the car at the moment. That is an awful place to be stopped. He needs to get going. That is the racing line after a blind, blind crest. I'm assuming the car's stall is rolling backwards. The marshals will be valiantly waving their yellow flags. I've seen him roll back out the window. So he's in a, yeah. a better spot, but still not a, an ideal spot. And it looks like Loggy's really really getting a sort of bit between his teeth but interesting when you see his lap time he's he's oh there we go still six seconds slower per lap than Gunon was in that car got held up by the gt4 you saw into the last corner you couldn't overtake it because of the yellow flags doesn't matter it's a different class you still have to respect and suddenly look was he lost three seconds in sector three alone so he's now got to do all that hard work and he's got to get past that lambo gt3 as well now gt4 pit stops are cycling through all the gt3 stops are done so right now, John Ferguson in number 15, taking over from March Yellow leads by five seconds from Ian Loggy, who has taken over from Jules Gounon. Third, but a long, long way back, should now be Alexander West in the McLaren. It is. He has taken over from Marvin Kirchhofer and Darren Lung's BMW uh, fourth, but only just because as he comes up dear leap, right up behind him is Sean Balfe's Lamborghini and James Cottingham's Mercedes and Andrew Howard's uh, Aston Martin with Cottingham having just got ahead of the Aston in fact so there's a really good fight for fourth there is John Ferguson for the moment out on his own but Ian Loggy stuck in traffic is losing time the gap is going up now in sectors John Ferguson is getting into his stride yeah he is and also Loggy's stuck behind that Samson Lambo that we said had just spun and rejoined and he's not really all over the back of him he's flushing his headlights he should be getting blue flags but again it's He's got to get up to his own speed and find a way around him, but uh, he's bleeding time again. It shows you how quickly this can spin. Big old slide for Sanson there. He's having a bit of a baptism of fire, isn't he? A wet Alton Park for your first round of British GT in a new car isn't, isn't ideal. A stop-go penalty of one second for John Ferguson for being short on the pit stop. So it was a tiny admin error from the team, letting the car go fractionally too soon. And so a short pit stop, a stop-go penalty for John Ferguson and also for uh, Mike Price in the Greystone GT Mercedes in ninth place. So John Ferguson will get the news. One second stop go doesn't sound very much, but the real killer is the drive time in and out of the pits. Yeah, and that's a brutal camera shot. That's the engineer who controls that and his whole world will be crumbling. And the start of the season, teams are a bit rusty. They haven't nailed their procedure, but it's inexcusable to go under the, the time. It's just not worth being that tight. Everyone no. normally says a safety margin of half a second, but if you're not quite happy with your GPS timer, maybe add it to a second. But again, that's day done. When you take 15 seconds out of it, he's going to be somewhere in fourth or fifth. But that's really on the merit of the stint of Martialo, giving him such a big lead. And yeah, he's got a couple of laps to serve that. But uh, yeah, that is going to be painful, painful for the Ram racing guys. I just going back to Mark Sanson's Lamborghini that we saw spinning. That's got gear selection dramas as well, just to add to his woes. Now, Johnny Adams' car with James Cottingham at the wheel uh, in the AM company here is on a move. Look at the inside of Darren Lung. So he's got himself ahead of Sean Balfe and Andrew Howard has gone ahead of Sean Balfe's Lamborghini as well. So now Cottingham is fifth. Andrew Howard is sixth. Balfe drops back into seventh for Darren Lung winner with Alexander Sims at the end of last year, but not the most experienced in terms of GT3 machinery, is about to get mugged by James Cottingham. Look, the race one winner who lines up on the inside line coming down towards Island Bev, but Darren Lung in the grunt and go BMW is able to fend him off. Yeah, a load of talk on the top speed of that car, wasn't it? It looked like Cottingham had a huge run on him. Didn't really defend it, to be fair. Now he's trying to go around the outside. It's really tricky, that BMW, the slow speed, isn't it? We yeah. saw Harbour have some big, big slides because Howard's gone all the way around him too. Look at the gap lost in one corner. Now Balfe's all over the back of him. 
Again, it's so hard to get a bit of composure now. He just needs to get his eyes forward, hit his marks, and get back to it. For sure, that BMW at slow speed is hard work. But I think we saw Harpo doing such a good job. We know it's possible. Maybe it's just a slight lack of experience, and later on in the season, he'll be in a bit of a different position for a fight like this. I think John Ferguson, though, when he makes that penalty pit stop he's only going to lose one place he's in now so the leader is in John Ferguson to serve the stop go penalty uh, but such is the gap first to third that it will only put him behind Ian Loggy. Uh, he won't like that but it could be a whole lot worse so we have 20 minutes to go just under and amazingly no safety car in this race despite the conditions despite the fierce racing right there goes John Ferguson back into the race and yet to arrive at Lodge Corner even is the third place car so that illustrates the pace of the Mercedes. And bear in mind, they're 15 kilos heavier than they were on Saturday for qualifying, and yet they are still blitzing the opposition. Yeah, the Mercedes is such a strong car in all conditions, all circuits. It looks like on such a dream car to drive, as we see one illustrating not such a dream, unless you're a rally driver, I guess, but uh, you know, just served a penalty as well for Mike Price. So he's on his out lap, probably lost his rhythm. Something I was alluding to earlier, and now he's got to get back into it once more. Alex West's pace has been really strong, actually. The last few laps, he's been one of the quickest cars on track. I think by the time the timings sort themselves out, he should be within about 10 seconds, I think, of uh, Ferguson. But Ferguson, his last lap when he came in was slow because it was in the 55s. Ian Loggy's doing 151s. Alexander West, 152s. James Cottingham, 148. So the yellow Mercedes in these conditions and in this company is now the fastest car in that leading group. Again, we've seen different conditions to the start of the race starting to dry up. We said we thought potentially that number four car with Cottingham on board was more dry suiting. You can see the dry line coming. It's not dry, it's drier. So I don't think we're going to see any out and out dry patches, but again, these cars are going to start working in different ways. Maybe the team that changed tires at the pit stop can have a slight advantage and the guys that left them on. I saw the Ram guys left their tires on from Marciello to Ferguson. And again, the tires are just going to be slightly harder, slightly less responsive at times like that. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how this pans out for the next uh, 17 minutes that we've got remaining. So race leader now is Ian Loggy. What's going on in GT4? It is now number 29, the leading car there with Ian Goff at the wheel. You're looking at 36, which now has uh, at the wheel of it Aston Miller. And that within the GT4 fight is to be found fourth. But again, it's looking very McLaren. You've got GT4, GT3 McLarens together. The uh, Sky Tempest and McLaren doesn't need the wiper at the moment, but I don't know whether they fixed it or not. There was some debate as to whether it could be, so it's still a very, very dirty screen that Kevin Say has got to peer through. I think that's not fixed, personally. Yeah, I'd say as a driver, I wouldn't want the windscreen wiper <laughs> person going with the onboard, but uh, yeah, he's going to be thinking he's driving a Dodge wiper, isn't he, now? Uh. Nothing to do whatsoever. And it will get to a point where there's so much mud brought onto the circuit that it just starts to get caked up. As you see Aston Miller actually having to brake from his big brother GT3 car. Although they're faster, they're quite clumpersome in these damp conditions at slow speed. Whereas the road car, more base Artura, has that. And then look at the power as they stretch out. And he's using his windscreen wiper just to mock Kevin Say there of how much vision he's got. But uh, yeah, very McLaren orientated at the front. And I have to say, Goff is doing a good job. Obviously, an AM driver. They got the jump because they've got 12 seconds, 14 seconds, sorry, less in the pit stop. But he's within a second of the pace of the silver guys behind him. So he's looking strong there. Look at all that mud on the track. I think that was mainly Marciello's off, but I think people are starting to cut the inside more and more there as well at the start of the show happen. Alton is a regular horn for single venue rallies. There's uh, clearly one today. Uh, yes, Ian Goff, just going back to the GT4 leader, he has uh, done many a mile in Formula Ford and other cars around Alton Park. Now there with the sticky tape to try and hold the bonnet in. Remember, it lost it in race one. Is number 80, that's the uh, Esme Hawkey, now Joe Wheeler. Ginetta, run by the Toro Verde team. Uh, remember, it lost its bonnet in the first race. Well, they haven't got enough pins, so lots of sticky tape to try to keep that in place, and it battles on. But again, because of the conditions, the car's getting ever grubbier, looking ever more tired as the day wears on. So the leader, Ian Loggy. Now there you've got Darren Lund, who is in sixth place at the BMW with Sean Balfe and then Mark Radcliffe behind him in the McLaren. Mark Radcliffe back into UK racing in number 27. We've seen him in Carrera Cup GP. He's raced in Porsche Super Cup as well as a, an AM in recent seasons. And out wide there went Mark Smith's McLaren as he ran out of uh, traction coming through Lodge. Yeah, it's going to get greasy now. So again, 
you'll start to find it just feels less grip. It, it's hard to explain when it's super wet. You get a bit of friction off the water that's on the surface, but when it gets to this grease level, the tire just literally slides across. You get very little feel and very little bite, so it's getting difficult for those guys there. But for their sort of first wet race at Alton Park, the pace is strong. Looking down the timing screen, we're getting a little bit closer now, west to Ferguson, 4.2 seconds, west to two seconds out of him. So I think that's going to be a battle that should start to look a little bit spicy in the next couple of laps. Alex West, quite a fiery character, so it'll be interesting to see how he deals with Ferguson, who's also quite a fiery character, yeah. when they get a bit closer, shall we say. Absolutely right. So here in the traffic, the two GT3 spec McLarens run together. Darren Lung, uh, who's not been racing for that many seasons, came out of the Ginetta ranks, doing a very, very good job. He's done quite a bit of mileage of late, things like the Gulf 12 Hours, as well as British GT at the end of last season. And he's not for cracking under the pressure. Sean Balfe behind him. Well, Sean is one of the most experienced GT racers on the grid. Remember, he was a winner at Alton Park last Easter in the Audi. Off the road there goes Mark Smith. He had a go at running wide at Druids, at uh, Lodge, rather, at the end of the previous lap. Now at his lops. So he's trying hard, is Mark, but uh, getting caught out just there by the conditions. Yeah, easy to get frustrated when you're in a bit of a pack like that. Just tried to break a little late, it looked like, for the first part of Nickerbrook and the whole car had a four-wheel slide, which it will do when you're hard in the ABS, you're asking too much of it. Sean Balfe there, race for his team, Balfe Motorsport, he's now gone to Barwell, probably one of the most successful teams we've ever had in British GT. But uh, it's been a tough weekend, I think, for the Balfe squad in terms of getting on top of this Evo 2, balance of performance, new, all, all uh, two arms are new to the, to the team, so it's going to be difficult for him. If he could get past uh, the BMW in front, I'd really like to see what his pace would be like. It has kind of stagnated the pace, hasn't it? As you said, Cosson was in the 48s. Now other guys are in the 48s. Cosson was in the 50s. The traffic, maybe. The tracks get to this greasy stage. Definitely doesn't look like it's raining anymore, and it doesn't look like we should have much more to come. Oh, I don't know. I still think there are spots falling over here. There is blue sky yonder uh, over sort of Old Hall Shell Oil's corner direction. But for me, this rain hasn't quite given up, and I think it's increasing on our side of the circuit, which is about here. Uh, Ian Loggy comes then out of uh, his locks up now towards Druid. So 25.2 seconds was the gap at the start of the lap, and it's gone up to 26, two thirds of the way around it. So now Ian Loggy just has to bring this home, and of course, hope that nobody else goes off the road and triggers a safety car. Uh, we've got a couple of cars in being investigated for speeding in the pit lane, one of which is the Tregertha Sansom Lamborghini, the other is the Wilmore Magnetic Jones Mustang. Now, John Ferguson runs second. Here he is up at Druids. He was at the start of the lap 4.8 seconds ahead of Alexander West as the cars now run down towards Lodge Corner. So let's keep an eye on these gaps then. That's your second place Mercedes. Look in the background, that Gulf liveried McLaren is third, and then look for the yellow Mercedes, which is fourth. Those are the gaps, second to third to fourth, and traffic allowing. James Cottingham should be able to close yet more on Alexander West's McLaren. Yeah, they're almost equidistant, aren't they, those gaps? And we've got 12 minutes remaining, so roughly going to get six laps, depending on where the leader crosses the next time, but I'll start to work it out. But uh, as I said, the pace has all started to slow down a bit. There's only a, a second between West of Ferguson, and then there's three tenths uh, from Cotton to West. So those gaps, it's so hard when you don't watch the whole lap to know what they fell across yeah. GT4-wise. Did they make a little mistake? Um, there's two cars between West and Ferguson GT4-wise. So after this lap, I think West should have some clear space and be able to show what he can do. How much does he want second? The more you push, the more risk you take. Is West going to be happy with a podium in third place? What's the difference to second? Long year championship. Is it worth that risk? It's... Uh, it's always hard to really do the risk versus reward ratio in the car um, and that, again the teams will be happy to advise on that but uh, I think I think they'll be happy with a podium in, in all honesty. So there is the McLaren out of the garage 59 stable Alexander West over Hilltop there is John Ferguson now in the first sector Ferguson was quicker and although to the eye the gap is not a huge one it's still four seconds GT4 by the way quickly updates that's now being led by Ian Goff from Jack Brown, 6.7 seconds between the two McLarens there. So they've been quick all weekend, the McLaren Arturas, and they're still looking quick come the race, as uh, the second race of the weekend, as Alexander West heads uphill once more. Yeah, I don't think West has got the pace now. The first two sectors, three turns loss over those first two. And again, you're just looking at the card, see if you can see anything in particular. It looks quite well balanced, not doing anything silly, but as we see, actually, the paddock motorsport car has got in front of the optimum car, so 
this battle has really been going on pretty hard and all the cars look like got banned but look at the bmw that was sean balf yeah. was on his bumper less than two laps ago and that gap looks like it's grown to three seconds and again you don't know what's happened at all and with the gt4 cars it's so important to get a little bit of luck those mclarens have switched order as well behind haven't they mark smith now is ahead of mark radcliffe so those cars then switch order alexander west third he's another Alton park rookie as well bear in mind so it's not a circuit he has raced at before he's raced pretty much everywhere in gt racing apart from here so over the timing line goes the barwell lamborghini sean balf at the wheel of it there this car seventh up to eighth mark smith down to ninth mark radcliffe behind mark smith's getting on with the job nicely learning all the time isn't he yeah definitely and good guy to follow in sean balf but yeah, like I said, Sean Balfe lost five seconds that lap to the guys in front of him. So that's really quite a big drama. It never sounds like a lot when you say five seconds, but in a race car, five seconds is an absolute eternity. You like, couldn't have a spin and carry on with five seconds. So I'd love to know what's gone on. And yeah, Smith is on the front foot here. He's feeling racy. It's the only non-Evo McLaren. So I think Paddock have done a smart move there. The Evo is such a big difference for these teams. If you aren't able to get the right testing in, if the driver's busy with the budget's not big enough, it gets to the inside of Balfe here to see the traction. Saw the McLaren have a little snap probably as the turbo spun up. But uh, yeah, Paddock running the non-Evo one, but they have a huge amount of data on that car. And in conditions like this, that's quite useful to have a good baseline setup to be able to revert to. So Ian Loggy and Jules Grun on the race leaders. Ian Loggy at the wheel of number one, the reigning champion. Over 28 seconds to the good last time. Eight and three quarter minutes to go. Great battle still going on here. Sean Balf, new to Barwell in that Lamborghini, trying to go defensive. Of course, he's been running his own team for many seasons, successfully as well, winning races with the likes of Rob Bell most uh, recently from in McLaren, then last year here, Sean Balf in the Audi. But now he doesn't have to think about running a team. He's here as a driver and having to really stick out his elbows and defend from Mark Smith, who is there behind him. They've got traffic to worry about as well. Loggy to Ferguson, 28.9 seconds. Alexander West runs third. James Cottingham chipping away, but that gap not coming down with quite the same big chunks as it was a little while ago. Yeah, West seems to almost respond to Cottingham's lap time. It's like the team are advising them of the gap behind more than the gap in front, to be honest, because it's stuck four seconds, Ferguson to West. Cotton's now just got it under four, so he's taken a second and a bit out of the last three laps, but it's still hard work with, with relatively small amount of time remaining. I think it's going to be really only GT4 traffic, and that GT4 traffic is so spread out over the lap. We haven't had a safety car, so we haven't had that bunching, so you will naturally trip over them in the most awkward places, just where you don't want them. That's always the way it crumbles. So then, it has turned out to be uh, a rather curious front of the grid in a way because 28.9 seconds of a lead doesn't really reflect what we've seen in the course of this race with the uh, cat and mouse battle between Jules Gounon and Raffaele Marciello earlier on but uh, since we've had the pit stops and the penalty as well for number 15 Mercedes little chance of that coming down unless there's a safety car and I think you'd still put your money on Ian Loggy as the quicker of the two he's a more experienced GT3 racer John Ferguson as you look at Freddie Tomlinson there uh, came into GT racing initially in GT4 in the Speedworks Toyota then into GT3 went through a number of co-drivers last year but has got one of the best in the business in Raffaele Marciello for the season and of course uh, Lello will do the entire year so that's a partnership that doesn't have to uh, cox and box over the year whereas Ian Loggy will have Phil Keane with him at 40 now for example. Yeah and there's a lot to be said about the continuity between the driver parents want the coaching element the pro to the amp tend to be that way around but also the setup of the car you know what the other driver wants you can keep it in a window much much happier and much much easier gap west now is 2.8 behind folks and so we'll start to get it at 2.9 behind so we're seeing these two mclarens in gt4 then this gap is closing as well the optimal car just starting to get back into the clutches of the gto car this will be for the first place oh this big big commitment there and this will be for first place in the silver class second overall and they're both still catching the overall leader as well goff so they're only 1.7 behind him this is going to get quite interesting it is indeed, so it is Ian Goff leading the way. Jack Brown's last lap was a 54-3 and a 52-6 for the charging uh, DTO McLaren behind, which is uh, Aston Miller at the wheel of it. There, number 24 of Andre Borod in the GT3 McLaren comes down towards us. He's learning about all to par all the while, but for second and third places, this McLaren fight looking like he's going to go down to the wire. A lot of effort being put in there by Aston Millar is going to be patient with the throttle here out of Nickerbrook. Now he can nail it up the hill, rattles up the curb a little bit. Yeah, and that's going to lose him traction. 
Just watch up the hill, trying to hear if he's full throttle. It's a bit slippy, got to trust the track control. So starting to get a little bit drier there, but then goes back to damp. So it's hard as a driver. You get given the grip at the high speed bit, but when as soon as you get to the brakes, it goes back to slippy. It's hard not to overcommit there. You can see nice and relaxed on Aston. That big silver pipe there, it'd be quite interesting to know what that is. It looks like it's probably for the driver cooling. I mean, all the teams are free to do what they want. They get given the car from McLaren for a lot of money, obviously, but then they can adjust it to the driver's needs. So maybe the driver's have been saying the car's a bit too hot and they've tried to cool it. A lot of the time, the teams now put that cool air into the back of the seat and it really helps cool the whole core down really? and it keeps a bit of the air going. You imagine yeah. these race seats, the bucket seats, they're very tight, but the air gets stagnant. So the air around your back is so, so hot by the end of the race. So it's quite a nice feeling to have it there. It sounds a bit luxurious, but uh, we always say it's necessary. A little bit of understeer on the way in. We're definitely catching, aren't we? You can see it visibly. It looks like yep. about half a second or so. And again, the car looks drivable. So this is going to get tasty. Four and a half minutes remaining. It was another full second pulled back by Aston Miller last time. And up front, John Ferguson falling away from Ian Loggy, being reeled in by Alexander West. He's down to 1.2 seconds for second and third overall. So this is second and third in GT4. Second and third in GT3 are not that far behind them on the road actually this battle is going to be caught by the second and third fight for gt3 before the end of the race there look behind them is john ferguson and you can see that alexander west is getting closer and closer all the time another tenth pull back in the first sector and now that he can see the car that he's chasing that's going to urge alexander west on even more yeah it's the best motivation you can have one because you can see it's a tangible thing but also you get to start to already understand where you're stronger and even sometimes even though you're catching where you're weaker that's sometimes a bit of a reality check oh, i'm catching it but i'm not as good as i thought there maybe i should try something what are they doing are oh, they a bit wider let me try that oh look at my delta i found two tenths brilliant you get given time for free. It's going to be an interesting dynamic, so I think they're going to catch Sansom at a similar sort of time as well before the end of the race. Like we saw earlier, there weren't any blue flags from so it's going to be hard. Cotton's catching, but I don't think it's quick enough to get involved at the end of this race. No, his last lap was slower, which might be because of the traffic, but the, the big chunks he was taking out early in the stints, he now can't do, so that car looks like it's had its peak reached. Ian Loggy has got three minutes to go, so two more laps I would offer you as he goes by. And John Ferguson perhaps is on borrowed time because now 1.2 seconds is the margin, although last time around he was only two thousandths of a second slower than Alexander West. That's how evenly matched those two are. So uh, now it really needs for John Ferguson to be delayed in the traffic behind Aston Miller to enable West to catch up to him. What was all that that was flying? Was that just a, a windscreen sticker? banner? I think Terrible, they're going yeah. lightweight version. So if they're underweight, <laughs> at least you can add that back on. But yeah, you can see Miller catching Brown as well. That's yeah. intense there, that battle. Borodin's going to be in the way potentially as well of the Shell Oils hairpin, maybe even into the first chicane. West hasn't quite caught him as much as I thought he might do. He got lucky with the traffic at the moment. There's borrowed in on the outside. Let's hope he doesn't get too much in the way, but he's definitely compromised Ferguson's exit there, I think. Here they come then now on the run up to the Britain chicane. So through turns Ferguson. That is Alexander West in another of those uh, retro liveries, the uh, Gulf inspired livery, again taking you back to FIA GT 1997. That colour scheme would have raced against the colour scheme on the leading Mercedes. But in and amongst the GT4 traffic, the race leader is coming into Lodge Corner. A flying lap is a 1 minute 47, and we've got a minute and 45 on the clock now. So onto his last lap has just gone Ian Loggy. That's James Cottingham at Nickerbrook, and he's fourth. And his last lap was a 47 1. He is still catching second and third, but I'm not sure he's going to get there in time. But he might if Alexander West is still stuck in traffic. Yeah, West has either been unlucky or not done quite an efficient job as Ferguson has with that traffic. Look at the gap that's extended. It just feels like West has been stuck behind those two GT4 McLarens at critical points, and the time has just ebbed away from him. Same with Cotton, he's got a little bit luckier than West. But as they start this last lap, Ferguson will be the happiest man out there on track with those traffic. It really, yeah. really helped him, I think, breathe a bit of a sigh of relief in that, in that aspect. So the leaders go through then. 32 and a half seconds with a lap to go between Ian Loggy and John Ferguson. Two seconds back, Alexander West. 11 tenths back. James Cottingham, the race one winner uh, in fourth place. And uh, bear in mind that car had an extra 10 seconds to serve in the pits. Well, take those off. It would have been in second place, pretty much. So uh, the car presses on, but potentially not to gain another place unless the traffic really plays ball. That's John Ferguson set for second. 
well, Ian Loggy and Jules Goon on one race two at Alton Park last year, but it was uh, many, many weeks later that the result was confirmed after arguments over the way that the red flag and the uh, then pit stop penalties were applied, whereas this year, no question about it, it's been a dominant display. John Ferguson in the traffic. Now look for third. West has been reeled in now by James Cottingham. Alexander perhaps more cautious in the traffic. Look at this for GT4, second and third, nose to tail. Jack Brown under attack from despite limited visibility. Aston Miller, who is looking for a way past as they come now down towards his lots. The two GT4 McLarens absolutely together. It's going to be a mad scramble to the line, isn't it? To sort out all the class places. But Ian Loggy and Jules Gounon win round two of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship from Alton Park. The two Cs racing Mercedes scores victory. Jules Gounon very happy indeed. And then it's going to be quite a long wait for John Ferguson to come through, but he'll survive in second place. Raphael Marchiello has done the fastest lap of the race from his stint early on. And James Cottingham has dropped back a little bit from Alexander West. I think he was on the lights there to try to distract him, but to no avail. So John Ferguson out of dear leap, he will come. Second place beckons. Behind is Ian Goff, who is going to win in GT4 with Tom Wrigley. Two local drivers as well from the northwest of England come through to win in GT4. Fantastic job done that by Ian Goff and Tom Wrigley for Race Lab. Second, John Ferguson and Raphael Marchiello, Alexander West and Marvin Kirchhoff for third. Johnny Adam and James Cottingham fourth. GT4 honours, well, you've seen the winner. What about behind? Andrew Howard and Ross Gunn come through for fifth place overall. And second in GT4, then Jack Brown and Charles Clark from uh, Aston Miller and Josh Rowledge. Fantastic racing we've had all day. There is a very nonchalant Jules Gounon. His hard work done early on. Bravo, Jules. Well done. And Ian Loggy, 32 seconds to the good. That was, in a sense, a relatively easy stint for him. Yeah, and they both lifted heavy weight there, didn't they? You'd say the, yeah. the win was actually split 50-50, uh, depending on their stint. And I think when we saw how close Marcello was getting, it looked like Ram had the advantage with the car set up. Mm. But then as it dried out again, it looked like it swung back to two season. What a start to the championship for that two seas team. One race one with Adam and Cottingham and now have one race two as well. So they couldn't have had a better start to the season, obviously, and they'll be super confident going forward that they're going to have a strong year with both their cars. And I do like that when you've got two strong cars because it will always start to get a bit fruity. There's never going to be team orders <laughs> between sister cars. You've got two AMs both paying their money and they can both crash into each other as much as they want. There's nothing the team boss can do about it. Uh, crash into each other, meaning race hard. Exactly that. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Just to translate. Yeah. Yes, yes. Definitely. So uh, it could be an interesting situation, as you say. It's uh, two Cs. Plus, you can now imagine all the other teams saying, oh, those Mercedes are far too fast, but maybe they're just very good around Alton Park. They always have been good at Alton Park. Well done to the GT4 winners, Tom Wrigley and Ian Goff as well. Uh, a new partnership, new to British GT, the pair of them, and uh, a great start to the season in the race lab, McLaren. Oh, it's quite a lot to digest after two uh, really gripping and absorbing races. Perhaps the first one was the rather more frantic, but even so, some good battling as ever all the way down through the field. Sean Balfe, only seventh in his Lamborghini, I'm slightly surprised about, but uh, one car that we didn't really mention in the course of the race, but perhaps deserves a little bit of credit for coming home ninth, Michael O'Brien and Simon Orange uh, with their McLaren. Simon, again, one of the more inexperienced of the drivers, but that was a good effort. Really good, because they actually pitted quite early. Yeah. They had slightly different strategy, so Orange has done a mega job to be able to lift that up and yeah, got past a couple of the other McLarens as well as everybody up in the pace, as we see Goon on and Loggy there. Gunon looking a bit cold, doesn't want to get his uh, his jacket off just yet, but uh, in, yeah, uh, awesome race. In eighth place, the Mark Smith, Martin Plowman, McLaren, that stopped on its in-lap, I gather, with an engine failure. Right, there are the winners. Let's hear from them with Bryn. Well, gents, that was uh, a fight and a half, really, for yourself to start with, Jules. It's good to see you back. Good to see you not injured after your little off you had the other week, but you had a real fight with your teammate from another championship as well. Yeah, that was cool. Uh, I think we started with different tire pressure. So obviously I was good at the beginning, then it started to rain heavily and he catch back. But yeah, that was really cool. Uh, I think we pulled a good gap to the to the rest and it was all about uh, pushing and I, we have a good competition with Lelo. We drive together, but we also emulate ourselves to go quicker and quicker. So that was good. Tricky, tricky day, you know, the weather was crazy, but Yen today did a fantastic job, no mistake, and winning with 30 seconds in, in the rain, it's pretty amazing, so congrats to him also and the team. Now, we saw Raffaele go off the rope. Did you get to see that in your mirrors? Yeah, actually, I was on the fast left, and suddenly something popped on my peripheral vision, and I'm like, what's up? I look, and I see Lelo half on the grass, and I'm like, oh, that's a big shunt here, and actually he saved it, so fair play to him. But yeah, after that, it was all about taking no risk, uh, 
creating a good gap to give the car to Yen, and I knew that uh, Yen will do the job, and the team did a fantastic job this weekend, double victory for them. I uh, couldn't be more pleased than that. Yeah, very quickly, Ian, just a very quick word for you, Ian. Uh, we said before, while we were watching this, you don't have to win every race to win a championship. It's not a bad one. Yeah, so um, I suppose it's a perfect weekend, P4 in the first race, P1 in the second. So, um, as I said earlier, you've just got to be close to the podium every weekend, and uh, that's what we've done. So, um, here we come, Silverson. Great stuff. Well, congratulations. I can see I can see Ian Goff now from GT4. So let's take a little trip there. Congrats there to, to Ian. Well done, Ian. Congratulations. Congratulations. Let's try and get your car in the background as well. Uh, try and find your teammate. But uh, a, a great uh, a great win for you guys. Just know exactly where it's where we'll we chase each other around the car park for a while, won't we? But um, <laughs> a great performance from you. It did start to get a bit tighter, but it seems to be something that you were managing. Listen, I think um, Tom handed over the car in such a good position for me. So. I was just worried when I got into the car that I was actually going to choke and lose that advantage. So I just asked the team every lap, just give me the gap behind and we're just going to manage it. And um, I'm just so grateful that I could, you know, just still pinching myself. I'm a British GT driver and uh, it's Race Lab's first time in British GT. Awesome. And I am fucking man. Awesome. Well, I was going to say, I mean, yourself here is your, your debut in British GT this weekend. That's and it. so in your second race, you, you take yourself a victory. So you must be feeling pretty confident, both of you, for the rest of this season. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely uh, awesome win that was. Made up for this morning's disaster. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely over the moon. Ian drove unbelievable in very tricky conditions there. So, yeah, yeah amazing. So happy. Yeah. Awesome. Well, huge congratulations. Well done. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you so much. All right. Cheers, guys. Two very happy drivers then in GT4. Ian Goff and Tom Wrigley, both in the Northwest, a home win. Uh, Ian Loggy lives locally as well these days. The Scottish-born driver, Jules Gounon. Well, can we have him as a honorary Cheshire driver now after the way that he was so effusive in his praise of Alton Park when he first came here last year? So they're in super slow-mo. The winning car, Jules Gounon and Ian Loggy's Mercedes AMG GT3. The two C's Mercedes wins race two. So the results are thus. Ian Loggy and Jules Gounon winners by over half a minute from John Ferguson and Raphael Marchiello, who had that stop-go penalty. Alexander West and Marvin Kirkhofer just hang on to third from Johnny Adam and James Cotting of the race. One winners ahead of Ross Gunn and Andrew Howard. Fifth and sixth, Dan Harper and Darren Lund. Seventh to Sean Bowles and Sandy Mitchell from uh, Mark Smith and Martin Plowman. And Michael O'Brien and Simon Orange ninth with Mark Radcliffe and Rob Bell rounding out the top ten. Another penalised car, Callum McLeod and Mike Price down in 14th and with its wiper dramas, Chris Froggers and Kevin Say, definitely not Kevin C in those conditions, at 15th in the Sky Tempesta McLaren. As far as GT4 was concerned, the winning car, 17th overall, the winners in Pro-Am as well, uh, Ian Goff and Tom Wrigley, the winning silver, second overall in GT4, Jack Brown and Charles Clark, and third, Aston Miller and Josh Rowledge, Ollie Webb coming home. Uh, in his GT3 McLaren next in the queue. So the next of the GT4 cars was the R Racing uh, entry of Sam Hopkins, number 23, that he shared uh, with Josh Miller. So despite the tricky conditions, an hour that went by without any safety car interruptions, without major damage really to any of the cars. So big disappointment though that we lost Morgan Tilbrook and Marcus Clatton from top three in race one, retirement in race two very early on indeed but they will bounce back, no doubt, when British GT heads for its next race in May to Silverstone for that Blue Ribbon three-hour race, the Silverstone 500, which is always one of the highlights of the season. A very different type of circuit, a very different format of race, far more strategic than the two one-hour blasts have been around here, where the main factor has been the right choice of tyres at the right time. So, an entertaining second race of the championship season. And uh, let's have a look at the best bits then of round two of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. Ian Loggy and uh, Jules Gunn on the race winners. And it was Jules going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Dan Harper on the way to turn one. The back swung through a wall corner and made that run downhill in the spray. And the weather condition, certainly for the first half of the race, as changeable and as fickle as ever as the rain came and went, catching out one or two drivers. In the spray, Raffaele Marciello started to make progress round the outside of Dan Harper. Brave move that, and as Harper got sideways, Marciello found a little bit more traction and was able to power through. Off the road went Sam Neary. Big, big spin. That car would recover to 13th place by the end, and he wasn't the only Mercedes driver in problems. This was Marciello's near miss a few laps later. He got away with it, as also did Eric Jones and the Mustang, but uh, Marciello then charged on and was the last driver to pit in GT3 for John Ferguson to get on board. But despite the fact they seem to have made an inspired uh, choice on the uh, pit stop, 
of time in terms of when to call the car in. They let it go just fractionally too soon. And for that, copped a one second stop go penalty. So the car, which had come out in the lead then, lost a big chunk of time with the drive into and out of the pits, added to the one second stop go penalty. After all of that, it gave Ian Loggy a very commanding lead. This was Mike Price and Callum McLeod's Mercedes Mike Price having a late race spin down at the exit of Hislops into Nickerbrook. Ian Goff took over the lead in GT4 in the car shared with Tom Wrigley. They were on target for a Pro-Am win within GT4 as well as GT4 outright. As honours in round two went the way of Ian Loggy and Jules Gounon after another hour of drama at Alton Park. Well, there is Jules Gounon when uh, Raffaele Marcello, the man with his back to you. Next to Jules is Alexander West. And so now the driver's being called forward. Alexander West and Marvin Kirchhoff are Head to the podium, where bottles of champagne await. Trophies will be brought forward as well in a moment. Then the second place drivers, John Ferguson and Raffaele Marciello, will step forward in a moment once they are called. Always like to see which drivers actually drink the champagne. Now the day's done. It's quite. It's a bank holiday. It'd be rude not to, wouldn't it? I'm not sure if Alex West's cap there on the podium, is that one of those ones with the stick-on hair, or is that, is that true? <laughs> actual hair? He's had a strong win to of that mane, hasn't he? <laughs> well, he'd be so busy racing, probably, in Asian Le Mans, as well as everything else, he won't have had time to go to the barbers. Uh, they're the second-place drivers, John Ferguson and Raffaele Marciello. They step to the podium, and the race winners, Ian Loggy and Jules Gounon, congratulate their rivals, and there the trophies now being presented by Intelligent Money, and uh, Ian Loggy and Jules Gounon go to the podium. Congratulations to the Scottish Franco pairing, and uh, Ian Loggy starting his season in fine style with a victory in race two, and showing that he's going to be as competitive as ever. But that fascinating duel between the Mercedes teams, two C's and Ram, as much as the drivers is going to be one to savour all year. And we know that McLaren's tend to go well at Silverstone as well, so that'll be interesting for round two to see how Alexander West and Marvin Kirker fare. Marvin's been a Formula 3 winner there in the past, for example. So the champagne is at the driver's feet. There's going to be a lot of spraying. And then, uh, just to tease everybody, now that the race is finished, out comes the sun. So they've had to battle through the rain of the race, and then the sun starts to break through for the podium. But uh, as Ian Loggy sprays, not much drinking here going on. Really good, wouldn't they? On every front, so they all need to work on that. I mean, the champagne doesn't taste the best, but it's still, <laughs> you've been in the car for half an hour minimum. You need some hydration, but uh, yeah, I think they all can do a bit of work on that. Well, Raffaele Marcello is all smiles, and uh, the fact that the championship has now got drivers of his uh, quality uh, is uh, extraordinary. A fantastic entry at Alton Park. Two fascinating races as well. The Intelligent Money British GT Championship is looking like it's in rude health for 2023. So great stuff from Alton Park. Thanks for your company this weekend. We look forward to Silverstone in May. But for now, from Bryn Lucas, Joe Osborne and me, David Addison, it's goodbye.